today I'll talk about congestion control in data centers. Congestion control in data centers is a hot research topic. Several protocols have been proposed and deployed in the last decade. At a high level, these protocols aim to achieve high throughput for long flows and low tail latency for short flows. However, we find that the performance of existing protocols is far from optimal and there is substantial room for improvement in many scenarios. As an example, this table shows performance of a few existing protocols in a simple simulation. The experiment consists of a single long running flow competing against stochastically arriving cross traffic flows at 100 Gbps length. The average cross traffic load is 60% of the link capacity. This table shows the throughput of the long running flow relative to the ideal value of 40 Gbps. The table also shows the queuing delay experienced by short cross traffic flows at the tail. With HPCC, a state of the art data center protocol, the long running flow achieves only 57% of the ideal throughput. The short flows incur 24 microseconds of queuing at the tail. Performance is even worse with older schemes such as DCQCUN. In contrast, a clean state solution BFC achieves close to ideal throughput for the long running flow and low tail latency for short flows. In this talk, I'll show you how BFC achieves this high performance. In particular, BFC proposes a new architecture for, for congestion control in data center networks. To help you understand the need for such a redesign, I'll begin by explaining the funda dra fundamental drawbacks in existing approaches. Most of the existing protocols rely on end-to-end -end feedback loops. In these schemes, the sender adjusts the sending rate based on feedback signals that are echoed back by the receiver. Typically, there's a delay of one network end-to-end -end round trip time in the feedback. If the network conditions change in this duration, then acting on stale information can cause the sender to underutilize the network or build up a queue, both of which hurt performance. End-to-end -end feedback loops are particularly problematic in modern data center networks as they are highly variable. This is because networks today have high-speed links. Typically, the flow size distribution is heavy-tailed and majority of the flows are short. This combination implies that the traffic can be very bursty in such settings. Moreover, these problems will likely get even worse as link speeds increase even further. In particular, increasing link speeds pose two key challenges for performance. First, with end-to-end -end feedback loops, the sender only receives feedback after the first RTT. As a result, at the start, the sender has no knowledge about congestion in the network. The sender can start at a low rate and risk underutilization. Starting at a high rate can cause congestion. As link speeds increase, more flows finish within an RTT and the amount of such uncontrolled traffic in the network increases. This figure shows the cumulative traffic contributed by flows of different sizes for three industry workloads. The vertical lines represent the bandwidth delay product for 10, 40, and 100 Gbps network with a 12 microsecond RTT. For the Google workload, more than 45% of the traffic is contributed by flows less than a BDP on the 100 Gbps network. More uncontrolled traffic means that the switch can run out of buffers more frequently, incurring packet drops that can degrade performance. Increasing link speeds also present another challenge for long running flows. As link speeds increase, cross traffic flows arrive and depart more quickly. As a result, the available bandwidth for a long running flow can, fl can fluctuate significantly at RTT time scales. In such scenarios, flows can struggle to determine the appropriate sending rate. Again, this can lead to both loss of throughput and congestion. We now repeat the first experiment across different link speeds. The top figure here shows the fair share rate of the long running flow relative to the link capacity. Notice that at 10 Gbps, the fair share rate is changing, but it is still relatively smooth. As we increase the link speed, the cross traffic flows arrive and depart quickly. Because of higher churn in cross traffic, the fair share rate of the long running flow changes more rapidly and congestion control becomes more challenging. Now one might ask, given all these limitations, is there even a way to improve performance? In BFC, we revisit the idea of per hop per flow congestion control. Per hop per flow control simply responds to congestion faster. In this scheme, each flow gets its own queue at the switch egress. In addition to the sender, every switch on a flow's path can throttle the flow. This figure shows a particular flow traversing the data center ne network. The packets of this flow are shown in red. When the flow starts experiencing congestion, it builds up a queue at the switch. 
The switch generates back pressure feedback for the flow and sends it to the upstream switch. On receiving this back pressure feedback, the upstream switch throttles the flow. Notice that the upstream switch is able to throttle the flow causing congestion within one hop RTT. In contrast, end-to-end -end schemes like HPCC take an end-to-end -end RTT to adjust the rate. Faster response to congestion means reduced buffering at the tail. Moreover, with per flow queues, the upstream switch can throttle the flow causing congestion independently and without affecting the service rate of other flows. In contrast to deployed schemes with per hop per flow control, there's simply no head of line blocking. No head of line blocking implies that the long flows in the network can act aggressively to keep the network busy without worrying about hurting latency of competing short flows. Per hop per flow control, this provides both low tail latency for short flows and high throughput for long flows. However, despite all these advantages, per hop per flow control is not deployed in data center networks today. The problem is that modern programmable sw modern switches have limited capabilities and it is very hard to implement such an architecture. To understand this better, let's look inside the inner workings of a switch. This figure shows the switch components for a generic per hop per flow scheme. The mechanism can be broken down into three logical modules. First, when a packet arrives at the switch, the switch maps it to a physical queue at the destination egress port. Next, Based on the queue occupancy, the switch generates back pressure feedback for flows and sends it to the upstream. Finally, the scheduler at each egress port forwards packets from queues while respecting the received back pressure feedback. Note that this framework is largely uh, is orthogonal to the scheduling policy. For this talk, I'll assume fair queuing as my scheduling policy. Achieving a practical design for this architecture is actually very hard. Modern programmable switches only offer limited amount of memory for bookkeeping. A switch typically has a limited number of physical queues to enforce per flow control. Finally, switches only support simple constant time per packet operations. These three constraints limit the design space significantly. So how do we realize per hop per flow control in practice? Our main contribution in BFC is a practical design that achieves an approximation of per hop per flow control. In BFC, most of the time, flows get their own queues at the switch and there is no head of line blocking. In our experiments, BFC achieves close to optimal tail latency. To control buffers, a BFC switch pauses flows causing congestion at the upstream. In BFC, the threshold for pausing is set aggressively low to minimize buffering. We can do so because BFC only pauses congested flows selectively. Finally, BFC uses a limited amount of state and only involves simple per packet operations at the switch. BFC combines three simple ideas to achieve a practical design for per hop per flow control. I'll now describe these three ideas in detail. Traditional approaches for per hop per flow control track straight for every connection going through the switch. At any given time, many of these connections might be dormant and not have any outstanding packets in the network. Maintaining state for such connections is wasteful and unnecessary. In contrast, a BFC switch only tracks active flows. An active flow is a flow with one or more packets queued at the switch. To enforce per hopper flow control, a switch only really needs to care about flows that have packets in the switch. Tracking active flows can substantially reduce the memory required for maintaining state. Further, the number of active flows at a port is smaller than you might think because of fair queuing scheduling. This figure shows cumulative distribution of active flows at a single port across different loads with fair queuing and FIFO scheduling policy. The vertical line shows the number of queues at a port in Tofino 2, a state-of-the-art P4-based programmable switch. With fair queuing, the number of active flows is less than the number of queues majority of the time. The intuition behind this phenomena is that a fair queuing switch tends to process short flows quickly, completing them and keeping the number of active flows small. In contrast, with FIFO scheduling, a single congested long flow can cause a large number of short flows to back up behind it, increasing the number of active flows. Interestingly, this observation about the number of active flows holds regardless of the flow size distribution and link speeds. In this experiment, while the number of active flows is small, it is still comparable to the number of queues. This implies that we need to use the limited number of physical queues efficiently. So how should we assign the active flows to queues? Recall that when flows share a queue, they can incur head-of-line blocking. 
Therefore, the objective for queue assignment is to minimize collisions and the associated head of line blocking. One approach is to use stochastic hashing to assign flows to queues similar to stochastic pair queuing. However, this approach is problematic. It turns out even with a modest number of flows at a port, the Berthe paradox implies that there is a significant chance that two flows share a queue. As an example, when five active flows are assigned to 32 physical queues, the probability that two flows will randomly be assigned to the same queue is 28%. In this example, ideally there should have been no collisions. Since data center operators often care about tail latency, even a small fraction of these collisions can hurt performance. We can do much better than stochastic assignment. In BFC, the switch tracks empty queues available at EG Crest. When a new flow arrives, the switch assigns it an empty queue if one is available. If there are no empty queues, then the switch assigns it a queue at random. <coughs> what this means is that as long as the number of active flows at, a, at an egress port is less than the number of physical queues, no two flows share a queue and there is no head of line blocking. Note that in certain scenarios like massive incas, the number of active flows at a port can exceed the number of queues. Head of line blocking is unavoidable in this case. However, in such situations, even prior approaches suffer and BFC still outperforms them. Dynamic queue assignment thus provides an approximation of per flow queue and is a key to achieving low tail latency. However, unlike stochastic hashing, dynamic queue assignment requires additional bookkeeping to track active flows. BFC uses a flow table, which is just a fixed size array to track active flows. In the interest of time, I'll skip a discussion on design of the flow table. Dynamic queue assignment poses another challenge for pausing and resuming flows. In BFC, a switch pauses a flow at the upstream if the length of the queue assigned to the flow exceeds a small threshold at the switch. With dynamic queue assignment, this flow could have been assigned any one of the physical queues at the upstream. So how can we pause this flow? In BFC, each switch marks a packet header with the current queue assignment at the egress. The subsequent switch thus knows the queue assignment at the previous hop. If the queue occupancy at the switch for an incoming packet exceeds the pause threshold, the switch simply pauses the upstream queue corresponding to the packet. Now we know when to pause an upstream queue. We still need to decide when to resume this upstream queue. The challenge is, even with dynamic queue assignment, an upstream queue can be shared by multiple flows. The queue corresponding to these flows can have different occupancy levels. Some of them might be below the pause threshold, while others exceed the threshold. To control buffers, a BFC switch only resumes an upstream queue when the queue length for all its flows falls below the pause threshold at the switch. BFC uses a simple counter to resume the upstream queue. For each upstream queue, the switch tracks the number of queued packets in the switch that exceeded the pause threshold on arrival. The switch resumes an upstream queue when this corresponding counter goes to zero. Communicating state across switches thus allows for a simple mechanism to pause and resume flows which requires a limited amount of state. To validate the feasibility of our design, we implemented BFC on Tofino 2. All the per packet operations of BFC are implemented entirely in the data plane and BFC runs at full switch capacity. For evaluating performance, we use the NS3 packet level simulator. We evaluate BFC in the challenging scenarios with high traffic load and bursty in cast traffic. Let me show you the result of one such experiment. This figure shows the performance of various schemes in a simple cross topology. For each scheme, we report the 99th percentile FCT slowdown across different flow sizes. FCT slowdown for a flow is simply flow completion time of the flow normalized to its best possible completion time. The goal here is to achieve low FCT slowdown. The baseline comparison schemes are DCTCP and HPCC. BFC outperforms both HPCC and DCTCP. BFC achieves lower latency for short flows and higher throughput for long flows. To understand how close BFC gets to the optimal performance, we also compare against an idealized scheme. In ideal FQ, switches perform ideal fair queuing among flows and switches have unbounded buffers. In this experiment, BFC incurs no head offline blocking and achieves close to ideal performance. Now let's make the setting more interesting by adding in-cast traffic to the previous experiment. In this experiment, an in-cast consists of 100 flows sending traffic to the same receiver simultaneously. With in-cast, both HPCC and DCTCP experience buffer overruns that degrade performance. 
Since BFC responds to congestion faster, it controls the buffer occupancy better, and there are no buffer overruns. Again, BFC outperforms both HPCC and DCTCP. However, unlike the previous experiment, BFC incurs collisions in this case, and there is some head of line blocking. As a result, the latency of short flows deviates from ideal FK. However, notice that this deviation from optimal is still small. There's actually a subtle reason for why this deviation is small. In the interest of time, I'll skip it. To recap, in BFC, a switch only tracks active flows which have one or more packets queued at the switch. The number of active flows is smaller than one might think because of fair queuing. For approximating per hop per flow control, a BFC switch uses the limited number of physical queues efficiently. Communicating state across switches allows for a simple mechanism to pause and resume flows. Uh, thank you, uh, and I'm happy to take questions.